with that, I think we might start. <laughs> um, yep, we're good. Are there people waiting to come in or not? Okay. Right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, a, 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 an American, my name is Helen Derbyshire of Access Info Europe. Um, I, what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce the panelists, just so you've got a sort of map of the time we're going to spend together this afternoon. I'm going to introduce the panelists, but because access, the right of access to information is all about asking questions, I'm actually going to start by asking you questions, and then we'll get back to the panel, okay? Um, uh, but before I say that, just a, 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 an initial comment. An American judge talking about transparency and its value in fighting corruption once said that sunshine is the best disinfectant. So specially timed to come with this panel, we've organized for the sun to come out. Um, but let's, let's uh, just stay together in this room for an hour or so more before we go out and enjoy the sunshine. Um, so very, very privileged to have a really fantastic panel of access to information experts with us this afternoon. Um, we've had some changes to the panel, so it's different from the, the program that was announced um, because of, of travel plans and sickness, unfortunately, but still we've got a star panel. Um, so starting with the people who were originally on the panel, Anushka Delic, an investigative journalist from Ljubljana, Slovenia, um, who is... Uh, who's working with the Organized Crime and Corruption Project. She's just been setting, she's just set up her new organization, Ostro, which she will maybe tell us a little bit about. And she's also the, the driving force behind something called the MEPs Project, which has been a project to get access to information from, about the spending allowances of members of the European Parliament, which is currently a case pending before the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg. Waiting to, we, we don't know when we're going to get a ruling on that, but fingers crossed it's going to be in favor of transparency. Um, so also amongst the original announced panelists, we have Andrea Menepace from uh, the uh, CHILD, the uh, Italian Civil Liberties and Human Rights Organization, um, who just got into Perugia today. Andrea and I are also both founder board members of Diritto di Sapere, the Italian Right to Information organization, Dritto di Sapere, the right to know. So I'm sure you'll tell us a bit about that. Now, in terms of making members of the European Parliament more transparent, <laughs> we have here a member of the European Parliament, but she's already one of the most transparent ones. So Anushka, she's not your target, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Julia Reda, who um, specializes on, a member of the Green Party, specializes on digital policy but is also both herself and with her, her team um, very active in using the right of access to EU documents as well as advocating for greater transparency of the European Union. So it's fantastic that you could join us this afternoon, Julia. And then uh, last but not least, um, in standing in for um, Christian Mir and Alberto Alamano, who are both members of the Access Info uh, Executive Board, we have Gavin Sheridan, um, who is actually a member of our International Advisory Board, so it, it works well. An FOI activist uh, from Ireland set up Right to Know, an organization there, and also is co-founder of uh, an a company called Viz Legal, which maybe you'll tell us in two words about as you speak. Um, and a fantastic user of the right of access to information experienced, experienced in re both requesting and litigating to get access. So we really do have a very experienced panel to share with you uh, ideas about how to use the right of access to information, how to use your national freedom of information laws, how to do transnational investigations using your right to ask, and how to request information from the European Union. But before we start, I really want to get a feel for the room in terms of who here has got experience of requesting information. So could I ask, do we have, how many people here have used your national or in another country your a freedom of information law and access to information law to formally request information from a public body? Show of hands. Ooh, not so many. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. 
How many of you thought about it but never quite got round to doing it? Be honest here. This lady here, another gentleman. Not many of you have even really thought about it. How many of you are uh, working on research, whether it be academic research or journalistic research or in your NGOs if you work in NGOs, and there's information you'd like to get and you don't have it, but you're not quite sure to go about how to ask for it? Yeah? One or two more? Maybe. Maybe by the end of this... Uh, this session will have a few more convinced that it's uh, a tool worth using. Now, lady at the front here, Pam, you said you'd use the right of access to information. Could you just tell us very briefly what was your experience? Was it positive, negative, if you can summarize? Okay, I've made a few requests. I'd say that the most interesting one right now is one that we've taken to the European Court of Justice, actually. Um, it's about this herbicide called glyphosate. Um, and we're trying to figure out whether or not it's healthy or good for humans, basically. And um, the European Commission holds the documents, but all of the scientific studies to see whether it's safe for human health have been done by private companies like Monsanto. Um, so when we requested the information, they basically denied us all the studies because they need to protect the commercial interests of Monsanto. Um, so we've taken this one uh, to court. Of course, we don't have a ruling yet, so I can't tell you yet if it will be positive or negative. Um, but it's a positive experience to at least challenge the institutions and that kind of secrecy. So, Fantastic. And it sounds like something very important that we should all be concerned about in terms of our health. And another court case that you should uh, watch this space and see what the, the final result is. Um, we had a gentleman here. You said you've uh, used the right of access to information is a um, request to the Italian uh, uh, Commission to, for the access to document. It is um, an internal document uh, by which this uh, commission uh, um, organizes work and they give me in 15 days. They gave you the information? Yes, yes. Okay. So a positive experience, that's great news. Because I know in Italy there's a lot of uh, silence from the administration, so it's actually nice to have a positive example. And one more, was there somebody around here who had used the right you? Uh, so yeah, I'm a journalist active in Russia, and once I ask for information to the administration of a small Russian town, about a certain violation in terms of ec um, ecological, um, ecological rights of the citizens. And uh, I ask a formal uh, explanation of uh, why these rights were being violated by the local administration and I received a, a formal answer and it was empty in terms of content but still useful to quote in uh, my, um, my reportage. That's an interesting example from a more difficult context of somewhere like Russia, where it may be hard to actually get information, but at least you've got a law and you can make some use of it. Um, the, uh, so we've got a mixture of more positive and more negative experiences here. Um, I should say that we're having this discussion about the right in a context in which most countries in Europe now have uh, a law on access to information or freedom of information. In fact, the only country in the European Union still without a law is Luxembourg. So um, we're, we're making prog huh? Austria. Austria, well, if you, ah, yeah, it's debatable whether they have a law or not. It's, it's the worst law in the world. It's very poor. Uh, strictly speaking, on paper it counts, but in practice, and campaigners in Austria are trying to get a, a, a new proper law adopted. It's a bit like the situation in Italy where you, you had something, but then there was a, a sort of upgraded version of your FOIA more recently. Um, about 115 countries around the world in total have access to information laws. Uh, it's become a sort of a thing that every democratic country has to have. Um, we're making progress, and yet we have significant challenges. And we recently had, you, I'm sure you've all heard, and there have been other panels, about Jan Kuciak, the journalist who was killed in Slovakia. And it seems that um, there may have been some link between his using the right of access to information and people being tipped off about the fact that he was carrying out an investigation. 
So that's very concerning when journalists using the right of access to information <laughs> are also running a risk. And, and when you said you filed a request in a small town in Russia, I was like hoping that you were not going to say that you have people knocking on your door that night, <laughs> threatening you to leave town or something. But you, luckily your experience was more positive. Um, but in some contexts, that, that is certainly something that's a risk. And we'll talk a little bit during the course of this hour about the safety considerations as well as the benefits of using the right. Okay, so now I'm going, to, I'm going to come around back to my moderator's chair. And I'm going to start by asking you, we're going to make this a sort of debate session rather than, um, rather than doing interventions. And if anyone at any point has a clarification or a question, just stick your hand up and we'll, we'll try to accommodate. Um, so let's start by asking similar questions to the members of the panel. Uh, Anushka, what's your, what's your favourite uh, request, or I mean, apart from the NEP's expenses, which you're still fighting to get, but ap apart from that, an example where you actually got information. Um, it's very hard. Okay, it's very hard to talk about other experiences when I have this MEP's project, which has like taken three years of my life already. Um, but um, yeah, I had a very interesting um, investigation I was doing into a Slovenian media owner that. Um, it was a long, long-running investigation, and I found out that his uh, wife, who was Serbian, was um, naturalized um, according to, like, uh, because she, her naturalization was in the interest, the national interest of Slovenia, um, which, given all the circumstances, I knew was bogus. So. It, was, it took a couple of months, but eventually I got all the documents behind this naturalization, and of course it was, um, you know, it, it, it was fake. So, I, I mean fake. The reasons were, she had, there's no national interest there. Um, and, you know, he's now prosecuted and so on, so it's a good, it, it was a good find. Um, yeah, and I, it's, I liked it, but it wasn't particularly uh, complex or, you know, Mm -hmm. No, but to, yeah. so it doesn't have to be. I think that's one of the messages no, yeah. that uh, fairly straightforward information can be requested as well. Exactly, yeah. um, in fact, in Spain, it's interesting. We had we managed to get for the first time ever in Spanish history. In, I'm based in Madrid, in Spain. Um, information uh, from the minutes of the cabinet, the minutes decisions of the cabinet, um, and there we could see uh, a series. Actually, as a result of those requests, we identified a series of problems in the way that. Uh, the Spanish nationality was granted and in some cases then taken away when it's been granted by mistake. So that's, that's an area where you can, it's surprising but one can get information. Yeah, I mean a similar thing now, I, I, I presume Maltese journalists are doing in Malta because of their passport buying scheme, you know, yes. there's a lot of FOIA there yeah. needed to get to the bottom of that scheme, especially since it's affecting um, the rest of the EU also. So, yeah, yeah. this this area sort of is, is quite interesting for, for freedom of information, hmm. I think. Very interesting indeed, thanks. Um, let's let's uh, keep the same order as we started with for the introductions for a moment. Andrea, um, as, a, as a human rights organization, um, you've been using the right of access to information. We're going to start with successes and then we'll come to challenges. So do you have a positive story to tell us? Yeah, well, that's a quite recently positive story about a uh, request of information that a list of requests that we filed on behalf of an international environmental organization that we decided to partner with uh, for the first time. And uh, in a matter of a couple of months, we were able, through the help of lawyers and activists, to get information that the organization had taken a year before to get only half of information. So as you can see that the value had of working together activists, journalists, lawyers to get information out from the government. And this is, was quite successful because we've, we managed to find out uh, a large uh, waste pollution uh, operation by a oil company in the Adriatic Sea. And the organization now has the evidence to build a campaign on that. And sometimes you, when you get the info, just getting the information is enough for the authority to start doing something. So we, the positive thing about FOI requests 
is that just the fact of filing <coughs> might produce an impact uh, on policymakers. And that's the biggest uh, result that uh, we, we had so far. But it's, yeah, it's not all rosy. Uh, I have a lot of, lot of requests that are not going to, to be met, definitely. And uh, next week, we are going to court. And for the first time, we are going to challenge the government on other kind of requests. Maybe we can. We'll get back to that. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I was talking to a journalist this morning who I don't, couldn't make it to this panel, but uh, he uses access to information a lot in South Africa. And he was saying sometimes the story itself is that you've submitted the access to information request. You can write about that, and that keeps up the pressure and keeps the story going as you follow what happens to your request. Uh, you can add something, and then we'll come later. to Julia. Or later. Let's keep, let's okay. keep going for now. Julia. Okay, so positive experience. Positive to start, yeah. yes. Okay, so there is one really positive experience I've had. Uh, perhaps it might seem a bit weird that a politician uses freedom of information requests to request information from other government bodies, but actually compared to the rights that we have as members of the European Parliament, sometimes the freedom of information law is actually stronger and more far-reaching. So I have access to more information as a citizen than I have as a member of Parliament. So I use freedom of information quite a lot to the Commission because, you know, us members of parliaments do not have a lot of formal rights to actually get any information from the commission directly. So one uh, case where this worked extremely well is, uh, so I work on the copyright reform and I requested access uh, to studies related to copyright and uh, this way I received a study from the Joint Research Center which is the independent um, or, you know, supposedly independent evidence body of the European Commission that is giving them the information they need to make good laws. And there is a specific proposal on the table about media uh, legislation, uh, what I uh, call the link tax, and I actually have a speech about that tomorrow at five if you're interested uh, to learn more about that. But basically, this is a change in the copyright law that's supposed to increase media pluralism and financing of journalism. And this study that was done by the Joint Research Center, so by the in-house research body of the commission, found that this law actually causes the exact opposite, that it's harmful for media and that it leads to media concentration. And the really great thing um, about this was not just getting the study as such, but I had asked also for all communication around it. And one document I received was an email from the European Commission to the Joint Research Center asking them not to publish this study until further notice due to orders from the hierarchy. And that was kind of the smoking gun that basically <laughs> the commission had decided, okay, we don't want this research to go out because it shows that what we're going to do is actually counterproductive. And this can be useful because then you can ask follow-up questions. So mm -hmm. I then did a request to ask, so what correspondence led to this decision from the hierarchy? And the commission told me there was none. Mm. So there seems to be either a problem with record keeping or these decisions by the hierarchy, whoever that is, are done completely informally, orally, and both of those I think would be pretty concerning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you, I think you followed up then in, about asking for more unpublished studies. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, uh, that's always, I think that's always a good strategy, like if you get a response to the freedom of information request, read all the documents you get, also the parts that maybe aren't the thing that you were looking for in the first place, and see if it leads to interesting new leads, because in this case it was kind of part of a broader, pro broader project where we found that apparently the Commission had made a lot of tenders for studies on copyright that were never published. And so I did a broader freedom of information request to the Commission to say, please publish all studies on copyright since 2005, or something like that. And on the day before the deadline ran out, the Commission published, I think, three or four previously unpublished studies. Some of them had been finished for over two years. They put them on the website without really saying anything and then responded, there are no more unpublished studies. <laughs> it's a very nice story because it's also using the right of access to information to get proactive publication of information, which is often what the end goal should be. Um, Gavin, you've, you've filed a lot of requests. Uh, you, can you select uh, a favorite story, a good success out of all of them? Um, there's a lot. 
Yeah. Uh, um, I would have, I, I guess I have favorite types. One favorite type is looking for how money is spent. That's one of my favorite class of uh, requests. So finding out how a specific government ministry has spent all of its budget and who were the vendors or who were the people who sold to that ministry over a space of three or four years up to half a billion or a billion euros worth of spreadsheets containing all expenditure by a certain public body. But I'd say over the last, whatever, nine, nine years I've been doing FOI, probably my favorite was, was the ECB one. Mm -hmm. um, so I used, the ECB has its own access to, access to documents uh, rule. And I used that in 2011 to ask for a certain letter that the then president of the ECB sent to Ireland um, in the midst of the financial crisis, uh, Jean-Claude Trichet. And he sent a letter to Ireland um, essentially saying allegedly that, that the ECB would, would shut off all funding to Irish banks unless we accepted a bailout from the Troika. Um, I asked for the letter from the, from the Irish authorities. They said no and cited lots of exemptions. I used the, under the Irish FOI law and then under the uh, ECB law I asked for it as well and they said no uh, at, the first, at the first request. I appealed it, it went to the new president, Mario Draghi, who sent me a letter saying, sorry, Mr. Sheridan, you can't get this letter because essentially it could destabilize the Eurozone if it was released. Yeah. <laughs> That's serious. Huh? So, <laughs> so, obviously, yeah. so obviously I appealed that refusal to the EU ombudsman, um, uh, who had coincidentally later became Emily O'Reilly, who was the old Irish Information Commissioner. Um, and she reviewed the whole situation and eventually she came to the same conclusion that it shouldn't be released, at least not yet. But she went to Mario Draghi personally and asked him that uh, he review the situation uh, and he agreed to once Ireland exited the bailout program set up by the Troika. Um, and on the day after we exited the bailout, I got a very nice email from the EU Ombudsman office saying, dear Mr. Sheridan, we are re-engaging re with the ECB now to see if this letter can be released. And Mar uh, Emily Riley went back to Mario Draghi and said, can you release it? Mario Draghi thought about it for a while and eventually he said, no, we're not gonna release it yet. <laughs> they waited a year and a year later, uh, the ECB uh, released all the letters that were sent to Ireland during the, uh, the bailout program. They built a, a really big frequently asked questions section of the ECB website to explain why this letter was sent. Uh, why in the context of the time it needed to be sent, why it's not really that big a deal, that Jean Cotrice used the word shall, you shall do the following things, ah, which was right. an interesting thing to tell a member state. Um, and uh, yeah, and then subsequently, the, officially, the Spanish also had received a similar letter from Jean Cotrice that was officially released about a month later. Italy also received a similar letter that was leaked to a, an Italian newspaper, but it was also subsequently released. I think as a, as a process kind of FOI, mm -hmm. it's a really interesting exercise to go through. That took about three years in all in all. But as you go through it, and obviously, a, a side note, as a journalist, I actually didn't get the story because the Irish Finance Ministry leaked it to an Irish newspaper the night before I was due to get it, which was nice of them. Um, but it was in the newspaper anyway, and it was published, so I was happy enough. Yeah. That, that sometimes happens, doesn't it, that if, uh, if a public body sees that they're not going to be able to uh, keep on denying you the information and there's going to be a story in it, they, they try to pass it to a more friendly yeah. newspaper to undermine your story. It's a risk. It's a risk that you have to take. Um, I have one sort of follow-up question uh, for you, Gavin, which is you, you filed a lot of requests over the years. I mean, this, is a, this, this one was a very nice story. It took a long time. Others, information you've got more easily, um, a lot of spending information. Uh, Julia had said, read everything you get, but sometimes it's a challenge to read everything you get. One of your solutions to that was actually sharing with the journalistic community, right? Yeah, so we were kind of a very, very small team of two filing multiple requests a week, looking for information across all sorts of things from all sorts of public bodies over the space of a few years. Um, oftentimes public bodies would release the information physically in paper documents and post it to us, including databases, um, <laughs> which is very hard to process when your apartment starts filling up with, with paper and you have to scan it all yourself. 
Um, but what the approach we took with that kind of problem was we, instead of trying necessarily to get to scoop about what, the, what we thought was the story from the documents, we would do that, but then we would subsequently publish all the documents that we had received in every request. And we'd engage with our audience and with other journalists to say, is there a story here that we might have missed? Is there other stuff that's in here that we didn't see? Because we're not all-knowing journalists, we just know what we know. Um, and, and other stories did come out of a lot of the stuff that we did publish. Hmm, fantastic. Yeah, so the, I mean, that's, that's a nice sort of collaborative approach. Um, I, either when you've got your story or when you can't quite see what the story is, but you suspect there may be things. I think there was one where someone spotted um, a very expensive taxi between two yeah. terminals in oh, Heathrow. Yeah. That, that, yeah, that was a, that was a particular one where um, we, we, I had FOI, an FOI of another journalist. Yes, it's, it's something journalists do sometimes. Um, because you want to see the original documents. And there's, there's, there's benefits in seeing original documents, not just for journalists, but for also for the public at, at large as well. But in this particular instance, the finance, the tourism minister had been traveling on a trip to India. And in order to get to India, he had to go through from Dublin to London to India on this official t trip for the minister for tourism. And if you're an Irish passenger, you usually arrive into Terminal 1 or 2 in Heathrow. And then you have to go to Terminal 3 or 4 to get to India. And he, uh, we, we FOI'd all the receipts and, and stuff for this trip. And one of our readers spotted a line in one of the uh, documents that said that he had taken a limousine from Terminal 1 to Terminal 3 that cost nearly 500 euro. And <laughs> it's a 15 minute walk. <laughs> so the public, when this story arose, the money wasn't the issue. It was the principle. Yeah. And the public were fairly incensed by this fact. I mean, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of euros were spent on all the trips. But the trip from Terminal 1 to Terminal 3 for 500 euros was what got a lot of people annoyed. Yeah, I can understand that. Um, it's a very nice story, but I like the fact that it's a reader that spotted it, and that's something to think about um, when you've got your information. Anushka, you had a, a follow-up that you wanted to make, and also it would be great to hear perhaps how you deal when you, you meet a, a sort of wall of resistance and what your kind of frustrations are and what strategies you have for keeping on um, with certain requests for information in spite of refusals? Actually, the, my, my, so what I wanted to add uh, revolves precisely okay, about perfect. what, yeah, so it's perfect. Uh, yeah, actually I wanted to point out that, you know, especially given the fact that not so many people in this room have actually filed freedom of information requests, I think it's very important to know that even once you get rejected and you will reject get rejected several times, many times, even on issues that you are 100% sure are of public interest. Um, you just need to keep on uh, because the, just the act of filing freedom of information requests is basically also in the service of opening up governments towards the public. And so even failed attempts are good attempts in this, in this sort mm. of arena. And I think this is something that's been guiding me for, for years. Um, and actually, one of the things that you said, I think it was 2011, <laughs> possibly, <laughs> in Bled. Ah, uh, yes. Maybe it was 12. It was, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. But anyway, Helen 12. then, I was listening to her, um, she was talking and at a... Training for journalists, training, yeah. yeah. And she said that everything is public unless it's specifically uh, uh, noted as confidential. This, I think, is the one single sentence um, that, that for me was guiding most of, my, most of what I've been doing in the realm of freedom of information. Um, and um, the question was how to, like, when you, when, you, when you hit a wall, well, we kind of hit a wall with the MEPs project. I mean, mm -hmm. our requests um, are in front of the European Court of Justice now. Um, but, you know, we're not giving up, we're, we're, we're running new investigations, um, and um, in Slovenia, when I hit walls, um, I tried to get information also in other places, sure. but um, at the same time, I think once you start doing, once you start practicing freedom of information requests, you really get good at, at one, sensing bogus arguments in, in refusals, 
and two, at your own co counter arguments for why something should be public. And so it's really sometimes a game of cat and mouse. Or sometimes when, uh, when, uh, when I get a refusal for something that is, we have kind of a good law on freedom of information in Slovenia. Um, so for example, we have a specific clause that anything concerning spending of public money or, or, or of, um, of, or the function, the, uh, sorry, work of a public official is public information. So, for example, the information that we want from the European Parliament, um, and we have to fight for it in the European Court of Justice, I would get in Slovenia like that, which is kind of bizarre. Uh, but so, sometimes I get refusals, even on things that are explicitly public, and I think a lot of the times institutions are either want, trying to protect themselves, they're afraid of, of, of releasing something that they know is public, but they're keeping it because, pff, I don't know, elections are close or whatever, some, some, some or other particular reason. Um, uh, sometimes they, they deny because they're just not good at what they do. Um, so in these cases, I try to call them and I try to, you know, st strike a conversation with them and see what's wrong and where, where the hang-up is. A lot of the times, I, you know, ad I get a, like off-the-record advice from the information commissioner in Slovenia also because, you know, it's it's sometimes it's also about tactics. Um, so yeah, I think it's just very good to start doing filing requests and then throughout the years you just get, it becomes a, mm -hmm. a mecha, a, like almost automatic in some senses. Fantastic. I think I mean, there's, there's a few really important things in what you said. One, one interesting thing is that as you do more appeals, and I'm sure this is what happened to you, Gavin, to you, Julia as well, and I'm sure for Andrea too, the, the more you use the right of access to information, the better you get at f formulating your arguments uh, as to why the, that particular exception shouldn't apply. I think one of the challenges for people who are starting out new to this is knowing really what kind of arguments to use. And that's another reason that we're doing this panel, because there is a lot of expertise already accumulated, and there are people, organizations like Access Info Europe, like Delita di Sapere and others, I guess, Right to Know in Ireland, and many organizations in different countries around Europe, who are there to help you as journalists if you do get stuck and are not quite sure how to appeal. Um, Many of you may have picked up at the door, but if, you, if not when you came in, I hope there's some left when you leave. The Legal Leaks Toolkit, which is specific guidance for journalists, and the Guide on uh, Access to EU Documents, helping to get access to European Union documents. Um, who do you appeal to? It depends a bit on the country. Often you do a first level appeal with the administration before going to either to an ombudsman or information commissioner or the courts. It's in, I mean, you ha have an information commissioner in Slovenia, the same in Ireland. At the EU level, there's the European ombudsman, whereas in Italy, really, the challenge is to go to the, the courts. Um, Andrea, you had mentioned working with lawyers, so maybe you could tell us both the sort of any challenging cases you've had and also how you've worked with lawyers to uh, overcome those hurdles. Yeah. We tend to use lawyers as a last resort, uh, <laughs> but it looks like we need we increasingly lucky, lucky, need lucky, lucky a last Alberta, resort. Lucky Alberta is still delayed in traffic. Exactly. <laughs> so that's why we started to work with pro bono lawyers, and, but we have also our own lawyers. We are a civil liberties organization, and litigation is part of what we do on on daily basis. And. We see that in Italy, for example, even the new law is quite weak, is not well implemented, and, uh, and it's true. The more you use it, the better service you can do to the government, not only to you as a user, because they need to improve the law, they need to improve implementation. And as an organization, as Diritto di Sapere, who was a, one of the leaders of the campaign for the adoption of the Freedom of Information Act, is our duty to keep working and advocating for a better implementation of the law. Because sometimes civil society organizations tend to run a campaign and when it's successful, they kind of leave it. And if the time is, has never been more crucial than now to work for a Freedom of Information Act in Italy, even if the law was adopted two years ago. Because if you don't use it, 
this FOI is a muscle that is going to become weak very quickly. And that's why we are using, uh, we are working with lawyers and we are trying to match lawyers with civil society organization, but even we are open to question from the public. You don't need to be part of an organization to do and to use our tools and to do a Freedom of Information Act. So it's not for kind of uh, superheroes working on very challenging issues on EU funding on following the money. It's even something that might be related to the school where your kids are going, to the hospital where your parents are need to, to go. It's a very, very practical tool and it's very easy. As an organization working in Italy, we partner with other organizations. We use the Elevateli software, which is an open source uh, software developed by my society. And this is a free tool that anyone can use it. And whenever there is a need for a support, even a small organization like us can help you file a request of information. So the things to do is please do it, do it, and do it. That's the only thing I think. We have been working a lot on the campaign as an organization, and then we decided that it was time to walk the walk and trying to do it as much as possible. Whenever, of course, this is, with this kind of legal framework in Italy, it's quite difficult to get information out from, from the government, but we see that this partnership between lawyers and organization and citizen is working quite well. The fact that we are able to go to court next, next week to challenge the refusal of information on the memorandum between Italy and the so-called government of Libya signed uh, on the 2nd of February of 2017 is a sign that civil society is in improving in using uh, the Freedom of Information Act in this country. Because we have seen in this case, a kind of, it's a kind of case study on the weakness of the, of the current law. It's a better law compared to the previous one, but there is room for improvement. And that's what we, we in parallel, we are working on, on improving the law as well. But what we see is that the exception is extremely broad, Whenever you ask for something uh, to the Minister of Foreign Affairs or the Interior Minister, there is the exception of national security. Uh, you are going to, of course, destabilize the country and all this kind of information. Even if when you ask what kind of funds have been accessed in order to pay for the things that you put in the memorandum, which is publicly available on the website. So we have seen that even filing the same request to two different ministries received a partial different answer on the same topic. Some of them would say, no, we cannot do it anything. Other, a uh, few months later, another ministry released part of the information. So you see that the more you do it, the better you become and the better the government is to at least not pretending that everything is going to be fine with the law or just because we have a law. That, that's fantastic encouragement for people in Italy to, to use the relatively new and young law and also to submit your requests using the Chiedi platform, the Alavatelli platform that you mentioned. Also at the EU level, we have something called Ask the EU where we try to make it simple to put your questions to the European Union. Um, it's primarily operating in English, although we have it in a couple of other languages, um, which, which we're, and we're trying to expand that. That's Gavin, you used Ask the EU for your European Central Bank requests, for example. The great thing about using these platforms also is that they, that the, in, the exchange with the, the public authorities and the answers are public. So it makes transparency more transparent. And I, I actually think that in some cases you get slightly better behavior because the public officials know that their responses to the requester are going to be public. Um, let's carry on with this round of questions about the challenges and bringing in perhaps a bit of the use of lawyers. And then we'll be taking questions from the public. So start thinking about your 
questions. But first, uh, Julia, what about your sort of challenges and frustrations? Tell us. Yeah, I mean, uh, you mentioned that it's uh, important that like you get better at asking freedom of information requests over time. And so um, I think it's really important to stress that everybody can ask a freedom of information yeah. request. Like it's your right to do so, but of course the institutions will try to dissuade you and to intimidate you from using these tools. Sometimes not because they want to hide something, but simply because it kind of is annoying and it uh, takes some work to answer to these requests. And so I've had situations where maybe the questions I asked were too specific, like, please give me the legal service opinion on this law. And then they say, there is no legal service opinion. And then I asked, please give me the legal service recommendation on this law. And they say, there is no recommendation. And then I asked, please give me the legal, non the legal service non-paper on this law. And they're like, here it is. So um, that kind of thing can happen. So it's important to kind of strike the right balance, to ask a question that is general enough to really be sure that it covers the things you want to have, but not too wide so that it really becomes a big bureaucratic effort to actually uh, assemble the information, because then, of course, it will be delayed. But um, my experience is that, well, I haven't actually had that many requests rejected. It's usually mm. just that they don't answer in time. So especially with the European Commission, the way it goes is I ask a question, I, they have my postal address, but they will come back anyway and say, please give me your postal address so we can process your request. First of all, they don't need it. Secondly, they have it. So it's just a way of kind of Stop. pushing back the deadline mm -hmm. by when they have to re reply. So I do that. And then the important thing is that you always, like as soon as the deadline is over and they haven't replied, that you go again and say, okay, you haven't replied and that you complain about it because eventually they will give you some information and many cases. It's just that probably 80% of the people who ask the first question, they never follow up. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes even already the question for the postal address makes people step back and maybe not follow up with it. So especially if you're using a tool like Ask the EU, it's not that much work to actually do those follow-up questions. Like set yourself a calendar reminder for the day when the deadline runs out and then just go back and say, by the way, you haven't answered. But like, yeah, this is one challenge that usually, like things like asking for an extension of the time. With the European institutions, it's supposed to be an exception, but it's actually the norm. So that's a challenge. And another challenge is that sometimes when they say that a document doesn't exist and you know it exists, it's, I'm not really sure what to do in that situation. And I, maybe, maybe the other panelists also have advice, but sometimes I ask freedom of information requests for documents I already have. Mm. Like, I just, uh, like for example, if you're working on a journalistic story, you've received something from uh, a leak, from a whistleblower, and you want to verify it, then it can be a useful tool to ask a freedom of information request for that document. But sometimes it's also a bit, uh, it's, it's, you don't have proof that something exists. So for example, there was this scandal that a European commissioner gave a racist speech at a private event. And uh, I asked a freedom of information request about like information on this event. And there was a letter that they sent me uh, from the organizers thanking him for his great speech. And it said in the letter, here's a USB stick with pictures from the event. And so I did a freedom of information request on the contents of the USB stick. And it was delayed, delayed, delayed. Eventually, they uh, responded, we have sent the USB stick to our forensic experts, and they found that it was empty. And it's very difficult to, to go against that. Like, I can't prove that there wasn't a malfunction with the USB stick. It just seems very unlikely. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. it's difficult. Like, what do you do then? Well, yeah, and maybe that's the point where a journalistic story just saying, isn't this strange? Why doesn't this document exist? Um, the good thing there is that they accepted the request for the contents of a USB stick. Yeah, yeah, like, I think it's important. <laughs> that's important. You, you can ask for more than just emails yes. and official documents. Like, you, depending on the specific law, uh, there can be quite a lot of things covered, like including things like text messages, right? Yeah, in, in, in some, it depends on the country, it depends yeah. on the culture. Um, we, we had a very nice example from Finland related to the, um, the, the response to the mi migration, um, the, 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 the drawing up of the EU-Turkey deal, and we saw a photo of the Prime Minister of Finland 
Um, we saw it on a, a picture on Twitter where he was holding a hand-drawn chart in a meeting. And so we thought, well, we'll request that chart. We requested on a Friday, and on the Monday, we received a PDF, in Finnish admittedly, but a, a PDF with the chart converted into something done on a computer. Um, so they'd actually taken this thing that the Prime Minister had done by hand, and within two working days max, had provided it to us. Yeah. So when we uh, think laterally in terms of what you can ask for, is the first lesson. Um, Just also, one, one more yes, example. On. That my assistant actually once did a freedom of information request for a board game from the CIA that they used to train uh, uh -huh. their agents, and he actually got it. Just yes. you know, because we like board games. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Um, photo, but certainly audiovisual material is something that could be asked for. Um, Gavin, on the on the on the challenges and the, and the use of, of lawyers. Uh, some reflections on that before we go to questions from the audience. I was just going to say as well, I just was thinking there that I was at an event just like this one nine years ago in London and I was sitting down the back and there was a panel like this and I'd never, I'd never filed an FOI request. Ah. And they were discussing, I think an old lady at the back put up her hand and she had this problem with looking for, she was trying to figure out why her local council in the UK had sold a house for a pound. And she'd, hmm. she'd reached a, a stage in her appeals process where she, was got, she had gotten frustrated and she was looking for advice from the panel. And I just watched that and I was like, this doesn't happen in Ireland. Why is nobody doing this properly in Ireland? I need uh -huh. to go back and start doing it. So I was just interested to, I yeah. was thinking about it there. It was, it was actually a very same size room, same number of people, more or less. Um, I think the frustration I probably have the most is in specific types of refusals where the public body either through malice or through ignorance, does not understand how to apply an exemption correctly repeatedly. Yeah. So you file a request, you know that you know, it's borderline commercially sensitive, but it's not. And you know the law, you've done it so, lo so long, you understand it, you know the case law, you know the statute, you know all the previous decisions of the commissioner, and still the public body come back and says, no, we're not giving you that. And you're like, you have to give it to me. And then you have to go through an appeals process again. Mm. I'm currently engaged in a court case against the Ministry for Communications for a specific public procurement contract that has now been appealed to the Court of Appeal. We're, we're four years in. It's probably going to go to the Supreme Court. We know the Ministry of Communications are wrong. <laughs> they're, they're making extremely technical arguments about the nature of what they don't want to release. They're going against 20 years of precedence from the Information Commissioner's Office and specific case law around uh, the balance between commercial sensitivity and public interest, because um, it's to do with public money and an EU uh, and an EU contract and EU money being spent. Um, so probably the frustration I have sometimes is that, and sometimes it's sometimes it's just ignorance. Sometimes it's the, the public body is not trained, or the public officials have not been trained correctly on how to apply the law. Mm. And often there's a default culture that says, "Oh well, we'll just not release just in case." Yeah. So we'll just yeah, refuse that's it. Very true. And you know that that the law says the default is the opposite. That's the whole intent of the law itself, yeah, is, that, exactly. is that, the, that, that the default is openness and only in rare exceptions should the exceptions be applied. So you end up with, this, with these lengthy processes just trying to get some basic information that you know should be released. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the things we're definitely hearing from the panel is that you really have to arm yourself with persistence and with patience um, to make use of this right. And I know that for many journalists who are on a sort of very short news cycle trying to get information immediately. It's, it, it may seem like the kinds of time frames that we're talking about are far too long, but I think that does pay off because sometimes you can get really interesting yeah, stories. And, you could, and the other technique you can use as a journalist as well is you can look for fairly mundane stuff that does get you stories in the short term while also pursuing longer term objectives that, that yeah. also get you headlines every, every so often as a case evolves. But looking for simple things like, like spending and stuff like that that you, you more or less know they're going to release can help you along in that process as well. Perfect. Now, uh, you add, yes, add something and then I'm going to get some Just questions. Um, a good uh, strategy is also like anytime you get an idea, just file a request. It yes. doesn't matter if it's tight, if you have time to deal with it, it's going to take time. Just like file them. 
you know, mm -hmm. you have an idea in the shower, file the request. It takes you, what, five, ten minutes, you're done, right? And you can go back to your regular work. So that's just what I want to add. Yeah, that, that, I think that's a very good tip. So just have a look at the, the re relevant platforms, have a little look at the law, talk to us afterwards um, if, you, if, you, if you've got an idea for a request but you don't know how to do it. While I'm going to ask for questions from the floor, I think it's, um, it's very nice to hear that there are sort of you know, people on the panel now who at some point in the past were in the audience. So it could happen to anyone. I, I, I have to thank um, Federica and Amelia for helping me set out the, the books and the stickers earlier. I think it was three years ago I asked for an um, International Journalism Festival volunteer to help me with the stickers, Claudio, who ended up doing an internship <laughs> at Access Info and then working at Dorito di Sapere. He's now working for an organization in Brussels. So you never know what might happen as a result of these access to information panels. Um, questions? <laughs> questions, yes, please. Introduce yourself as well. Yes. Hi, Giordano Corsu, a journalist uh, and multimedia well, activist, I don't know, <laughs> a few other things. Um, I live in France, and it's a question on the journalistic side, let's say, uh, because if you file a request for transparency, accountability, normally there are no issues with this, but for mm, journalism, um, is your identity, the identity of the demander, uh, the one who files uh, the, the, the request, always protected, or in the reply, there's also the information about who requested it? Okay, Let's, what I suggest we do is we get a, a number of questions, okay. because we've got... 17 minutes left. Um, so what, a question on identity, um, that's a really important question. Uh, oh, we've got more. Um, this, you're, you're doing it, I'm standing up the front, you're, you're running around, great. Um, so gentleman there and then a lady, or either way. Hi, hello, uh, I'm Fazlamat from Osservatorio Balkani Caucaso. I'm a Turkish journalist working for an Italian outlet. And I, um, I wanted to know uh, what the law say uh, about uh, getting information from pri private companies. Uh, I mean, <laughs> many of the deals that are going on between, uh, for example, the Turkish government uh, and uh, private companies abroad are not uh, easily reachable. So uh, what are our legal uh, possibilities to reach that deals to understand fully what's going on between governments and private companies? Thank you, very interesting question. How do you get to the private sector? Uh, gentleman here. Uh, Tom Parfit from the uh, Daily Express in London. Um, I use the FOI Act quite a lot. And one of the big issues that was touched upon at the end of the panel was the delays. So in the UK, you've got, you've got a reply of in 20 days, but it's often delayed. And so I'm a news reporter, so most of the time, even if they do reply within the 20 working days, the story is no longer newsworthy. I just wanted to know how you deal on, de not necessarily long form investigations, but day to day on standard news stories, how you deal with delays and getting an answer three months after the newsworthy period has passed. Okay, thanks. Uh, a, a concern about the delays. I know some, there's some other panels that people have to go to, but from the people remaining in the room, do we have maybe one or two more questions? <coughs> something that's not clear, something you'd like to know. Yes, please. So it's probably more a follow-up question to what you said about private companies. What about associations like, uh, let's say, the European Football Association, UEFA? What about them? Can we ask them for information? Okay, fantastic. So thanks for the questions. We've got, let's start with the question of identity because this is a really important one. I had already mentioned um, that possibly uh, the, the journalist in Slovakia who was killed um, his identity was linked to his request, which could have uh, led people to understand that what he was investigating. Um, Julia, you mentioned the problem that we had at the EU level with, uh, with the European Commission now insisting on everyone's postal address. It's a kind of control. Who are you? Yeah. Who are you asking for this information? Um, I've, I've got some thoughts on this, but I'll, I'll go mm. to the panel first in terms of... What about this problem of having to identify yourself? Does it really matter when um, it's a request for, when anyone can ask for the information? It's nothing about me personally. It should be a decision, can this information be public or not? Yeah. So, Julia, do you want to kick off and then Anushka? Yeah, I mean, of course, uh, 
you have to distinguish between situations where you generally trust the rule of law in the place or not. Because mm. if you, you know, they have to have a way of contacting you. So if you don't trust that there is rule of law and that the person who is going to be handling your request is trustworthy, then definitely there is a certain risk. So, um, uh, but even, even when you do trust that, of course, there are things that can go wrong. So what I would suggest in terms of practical advice is that if it's a sensitive subject, consider having somebody else ask for you, somebody who is in a position where they are less, uh, um, less of a target, basically. So this can even be an organization. So this is something also that I do sometimes, like if I don't want the people who I'm asking to know that I'm looking into it. I just have somebody else ask the question who is not directly related to, to the issue. That's something you can do. And also, like with this postal address requirement, you can also use an office address or something like that. You don't actually have to disclose where you live if, if you uh, find that worrisome. And I, honestly, I don't think the commission has any interest in my postal address at all. It's purely a way of delaying the thing. So if I, I don't know, if I gave a fictitious postal address, they would probably respond to the request just the same. Mm. Yeah. Um, Anishka, on this one. Yeah, um, in Slovenia, unfortunately, we have to give our so name, last name, address um, because of also the law on administrative procedure. Um, and we had a lengthy conversation recently about this mm -hmm, topic. Yeah. Um, that in some examples, for, for example, in Slovenia, the fact of the of the identity of the requester is also tied to the complaints process. So it's a good excuse. For, to keep this on the books. But uh, tragically, in Jan's case, um, we do have a lot of information that it, uh, well, we were not able to 100% to bulletproof uh, substantiate with like official sources. But Jan's um, identity, so name, last name, date of birth, uh, address of permanent, uh, so permanent address allegedly were shared with the with, so basically with the subjects of his requests. And um, we do think that this was what led the killers to his house. Mm. Um, and this example, I mean, I'm very, it's horrible that a journalist has to die for something to become a problem, clearly. Mm. But this clearly is a problem, and we need to tackle it, I think, um, at the EU level and national levels. Um, this should not happen. Nobody should be endangered because they are exercising the right to know. Mm. It's something that we've been looking at in Access Info, possible solutions, because we also have a lot of evidence that requesters are treated differently um, journalists, NGOs, people who are known versus people who are not known. I think, Andrea, you said that I mean, if, it's, if it's chilled asking, it's, it's a different treatment. That, that's, yeah. that's a problem. That's a serious problem. And one of the ideas is that there could be some way of, of, of identifying the request of our secure system, but the people processing the request, uh, it, they don't know who the requester is, so that there can be some sort of encrypted channel for communicating with the requester. But of course, that's, that's, there's lots of technical hurdles there. Also, it means you may have to subscribe to some kind of system in the first place if you don't have it in your country. Um, what, you've, if, what if you want to file transnational requests? So there, it, it's not easy. I, the, the question about your right to appeal afterwards the other solution is that anyone can appeal a denial. Um, but that gets complicated as well. Um, anyway, th th those, these are issues that we're looking at. We had a couple of other questions about access to private companies. Um, I don't know if, uh, Gavin, I mean, you, you, you've got some experience of getting access to via public bodies to information about private or yeah, semi-private companies. It's never, it's never straightforward, unfortunately. Like, there's, there's a couple of... There's a couple of techniques you can use to get information from private companies uh, with varying degrees of success or not. So obviously one is SARs. If you know somebody who works for that company or you want to get information from a company that can file a data protection request uh, on your behalf for information about them. Now that's a very limited way to do it. 
because it only relates to that person's individual status within that company. So, for example, it's, it's what you would use with Facebook. If you wanted Facebook to tell you what they know about you individually, you can file an SAR, which would become much more powerful under GDPR from next month. And when it comes to how states interact with contractors or with, with, with vendors, um, it varies. If, if, the, if, the, if, the state par if the state that you're dealing with has a reasonably robust FOI law, usually um, its FOI law will, will have provisions around how, uh, when a contract is awarded, how that, how that company has to interact with and what information should be made available via the state. So for example, in an Irish example, if a, if a company is engaged by the state and is receiving public money in return for a service, in some cases the company itself can fall under FOI for the purposes of that contract, yeah. right? So the documents that, that relate to uh, that particular contract, the company themselves become subject to it. The other ways companies can be subject to it, it sounds obvious, but sometimes people miss this, is that state-owned companies are subject to FOI in Ireland. Um, so that while they're commercial enterprises, they're for profit, they're, they might look and feel like they're, that they're not public bodies, but they actually effectively are, they're subject to FOI as well. I think in the example you gave, it's, it's to do with a, a Turkish, the Turkish government and a, and a private company. Sometimes there's databases that you can access to see, you know, so there's procurement databases if it's, if it's uh, an EU country and it's, uh, there's tenders being awarded. Um, Turkey is in the common market as well, though, I guess, but I, I think there's, it, it depends on the country, it depends on the company, it depends on what they're doing. Um, it's not straightforward, unfortunately. That's my best answer. Yeah, I think I think in the, in, in terms of advancing the right of access to information, um, the, the 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 human rights activists groups like uh, Access Info and Dorito Di Sapere that are working on advancing this right, we've managed to secure in the last twenty years a right of access to information from government bodies. We've still got work to do in terms of figuring out how to get the right kind of information from private bodies. We've, we've got a few minutes left. We've still got the question on time frames. So timing is the issue. Um, but I'd just like to say that Alberto Alemano has arrived. Um, and uh, I don't know if you want to come up and sort of jump in on the, on the panel. Also to say we've got in the room another um, Access to Information, Freedom of Information star with uh, Birgitta Alfter who's managed. Hi, really great that you could make it to the panel. Um, uh, you may, you may, we may try to give you a quick opportunity to tell us your favorite FOI success. Before. Maybe we could do that right now, Birgitta. Just give us we carry on, all right. Um, so, Alberto, um, just to give you a chance while we answer this, I don't know how much of the debate you've managed to catch up on, but one very specific question. We talked uh, on the panel about um, the need to work with lawyers. Um, and could you just tell us sort of in two words about how you, from the sort of network of pro bono lawyers that you have, how you've worked with requesters to help fight to get information, very briefly. Thank you, Ellen. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to, to be here and to address some of the questions and perhaps to make a link between a right of access to documents as the privileged instrument for you as investigative journalists to gather information in the reality of the practice. Uh, of course, we're talking about the administrative complaints, administrative requests, which seem to be very easy and in reality are very complicated, as is a, was already emerging from this exchange. Hence the need to make sure that when you are thinking about gathering some information, instead of going alone, you might consider to be accompanied by a pro bono lawyer, somebody who might have the expertise, the time, the talents, the experience to actually anticipate some of the questions that might arise later on. And that's what we have been doing over time by providing, I would say, systematically almost uh, advice to Access Info Europe, in particular when gathering information which are particularly sensitive or where we want to put on the agenda of the policymaker a new issue. So that's very interesting from a, a journalist perspective. You might use FOIA to gather information, but also to address an issue which is system, system, systemically problematic. What I mean by that, you might convey to the authorities a systemic problem you gather uh, every single time you try to gather certain information at different level of government, which might be several cities, which might be different local governments, which might be different states that they systematically refuse to provide this information. So there's a dual uh, usages, I think, of FOIA for investigative journalists. To get the information, you need to write a piece and to investigate uh, further what you're doing, but also to potentially adjust a particular situation or fix it 
or to highlight a problem which goes well beyond uh, where you probably started on. Um, and to do so, probably you need to tap into the potential of lawyers who would like to devote some of their time to uh, administrative actions. So, sorry, Alberto, but because we're really short, we're short of time yeah. and we have a question on time. So that could be, for example, to take a, um, some, a strategic case to tackle consistent delays in, respond, in meeting the time frames provided for by law. I mean, that is something that one could challenge, particularly if a public body is Absolutely. breaching the time frames. If you realize that every single time you, <coughs> you ask for that information, you are requested this personal information Julia was referring to, or you are <coughs> systemically denied access, then you might start gathering all these attempts at gathering information and showing the ombudsman or the administrative court that there's a real issue there. Yeah. So you, you can have this systematic change. This is great because you can use this strategically and <coughs> it, it, you could really advance a particular cause, a particular issue you, you, you are putting forward. And it's something we've been doing in the European space, but it can be reproduced at the local level also very easily. Yeah, Fantastic. I think we should really let, let, talk about that because yes. I have at least a dozen cases probably already with <laughs> delays, but I do want to answer the question because I don't want to give anyone the impression laugh. that oh, freedom of information is not that <coughs> useful of a tool for journalists because you're not going to get the answer in time anyhow. Because I think there are a few things that you can do about that. Um, of course, I'm not a journalist, but I come from a very small party. So if I want to have an effect, um, I have to drum up public attention. So I sometimes work a bit like a, a campaigner uh, when it comes to publishing stories myself. And so one thing that I've done, like if I feel that the news cycle is moving on, and if I don't publish the story now, but I don't have the answer, I would go ahead with publishing it anyway. So I have um, sometimes uh, published uh, a document that I had already received through a leak or through some other way, um, even though the request was still pending. Or another thing you can do is you write the story with the information that you have, and then you add to the story, and by the way, we have filed a freedom of information request on this. Because then I think it will be easier once the response comes to also convince your editor that uh, this is something worth following up on. It's already been reported on, and this is kind of now the next step in the news cycle. So um, I would suggest not to pass up an opportunity to report on something just because you haven't received the answer yet. Because you never know if, if, you know, if it's really a good answer, then it will be also worth another article on it. Okay, so again, the persistence and to keep trying. We've got like a minute left. Uh, in 10, 15 seconds, well, well I've been given the signal. Um, uh, yes. Uh, uh, best piece of advice I can give is find somebody else who's interested in FY2 so you don't feel lonely. Oh, <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> yeah, we're uh, all very friendly people. Yeah, so. we, FO, I get your FOI friend, huh? To touch on your delays, I sometimes, what I sometimes do is if I know something is definitely of public interest and I'm in a hurry, I just put it in my request and I say, I think this is not a problem to release, so could you please do it faster than you know, the end date of your deadline? Sometimes it works. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Andrea, a last reflection, tip? Uh, yeah, I think uh, get in touch and um, if you don't ask, you won't get. So yeah, we need to work true. together. <laughs> that's certainly true. <laughs> filing, filing a request for access document is already a news. So tell your colleagues or also journalists to report about it. Because if you do, you will create further pressure on the authorities to actually release that information. And if you need help, you can knock the door at the good lobby and we're going to match you with, uh, with a lawyer who might have some experience and help you out in that. So time is the biggest challenge that we all have as human beings and we've run out for this session. But thank you very much indeed. Thank you to all the panelists. Oh, Julia, oh. well, it was kind of a last word. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I think it's tip. fine. I thought it's you'd fine. already done it, um, but go on. Very, yeah, very but fast. If, you know, if you need help with anything, just feel free to get in contact. So basically, you already have your FOI friends. Yeah. It's the people on this panel and other people in this room. So um, don't hesitate to be in contact with us, and we'd be delighted to continue beyond this session sharing our experiences, tips, strategies, and so forth. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Okay, well done everyone, that was fantastic.